Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Today's episode is brought to you by Barrels Ahead. Barrels Ahead is a wine and craft marketing agency that propels organic growth by using the powerful combination of content development, search engine optimization, and paid search. Barrels Ahead specialty is helping you perfect your marketing strategy so you can enjoy the results and revenue your business deserves. Barrels Ahead knows that your business is unique, and they work with you to create an actionable and one-of-a-kind marketing strategy, one that highlights your authenticity and makes your business stand out from your competitors. So what are you waiting for? Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more and schedule a strategy call. So before I introduce today's guest, I want to give a shout out to Shana Bull. Shana was just named by LinkedIn as one of the top 16 marketers to follow. Go over to her site, shanabull.com, to learn more about the great work she is doing to help wine and food brands tell their story through social media, and be sure to follow her on LinkedIn. So today's guest is Darren Fox. Darren is the president and founder of Idea Marketing Group, an award-winning marketing agency known for web design and development. Now, I've known Darren for a few years. You know, and what I admire most about his agency is they're not afraid to roll up their sleeves and dig in deep. You know, what they say on their site is true. They truly eat, sleep, and code. Darren's got over 20 years of experience in the industry and also runs a beverage-focused podcast. And I I love the play on words. It's called Picture This. On on his cast, he talks with leaders in the beverage industry about how they got into it and and what they love about it. So, Darren, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's awesome to be on here. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how did you get into this industry? And yeah. And yeah. So it was, tell me tell <clears throat> your background. Yeah, sure. So it's kind of an interesting story there. I was working at another agency for a little while and, you know, I, I always had this itch to kind of go off on my own and start an agency too. So you know, it's, I had even done this logo design and it was just sitting on a pad of paper for like two years before I finally decided, you know, now's the time to do it. And I finally did it. I went off on my own. And, you know, one of the ways that that happened is, you know, I was kind of thinking about, it, I'm like, well, I'm not really going to be able to just start an agency right out of the blue. I, I've got to do some freelance work and build up my portfolio. Mm-hmm. And it was something that, when I was at another agency, I wasn't really allowed to do moonlighting or freelance work or anything like that. So my thought was, you know, I'm going to go apply somewhere that I can do marketing. And then at night I can slowly start to build my portfolio. So I actually went and interviewed at a restaurant group in Chicago called uh, Phil Stefani signature restaurant group. And you know, they had an opening for a marketing position. So I was there and I was interviewing with the marketing manager and the chief financial officer at the time too. And, you know, he kind of threw a curveball at me, which, you know, it's kind of that standard question that you get asked at all the interviews is like, where do you see yourself in five years? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know me, I'm brutally honest about everything. So if somebody asked me a question, I'm just going to straight up tell them. Oh, not here. So I told them, I'm like, well, I, I plan to start an agency and go off on my own doing this stuff. And he's like, well, what if we became your first customer? And instead of us hiring you, oh. you could just do the brand sites for us. And then I was blown away because, you know, that was a huge opportunity for me. Yeah, what a fun Because... At, yeah, at the time they had um, twelve different brands oh, within man. the group. So right out of the gate, that was like twelve website projects that I was able to get, and I was ecstatic about it too because <clears throat> you know I didn't have anything like that, <laughs> and to have a brand like that to be able to just dive right into from the very beginning was awesome. And you know from there, 
I built the websites. It was just a one man operation. There was a lot of sites that I ended up building and delivering in I think like four or five months. I was just like cranking through them and that was really all I was doing. <laughs> it was, so it was when cool. was this? Back in two thousand eight or so? Yeah, two thousand and nine. Oh, so okay. right when the economy tanked was the the time I decided to start an agency. <laughs> so I did like, too. I, I started yeah. an agency called Nimble Toad in two thousand and eight. Or yeah, yeah. So not really the, the the best time to start a business, but a lot of things is like whenever you start at a challenging time like that, it is usually, you know, those are the companies that survive the longest because they know what it's like, um, you know, working in that kind of environment. Absolutely. So you had that unique um, that unique opportunity. You went from you just skipped the whole freelancer and went straight to industry, straight to agency, straight in. Awesome. Yeah. So it was cool, and then from there. Um, they even helped put me up with an office space too. Oh man. So like, I'm going to be forever in debt to them too. So shout out to Steven Hartenstein. Um, and I'm yeah. still friends with the marketing manager, um, Amy, you'll vary as well too. And it was, it's just been an awesome relationship. And what's crazy is Amy even came and worked with me for a little bit when the agency was a little bit bigger too. So it was just a lot of cool relationships that were formed. Um, you know, and as soon as you get a, somebody in your portfolio that's like that, mm -hmm. others started coming on board too. So we had a, just a lot of restaurant clients. Like that's pretty much what we were doing. Um, oh, man. So all sorts of restaurants in Chicago. And then we landed another pretty big restaurant group, uh, Rosebud Restaurants, which mm. is also really well known in Chicago. And same about the same size too with the different mm -hmm. concepts that they had. And yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got into it. And then it was about year three or so, um, is when I made my first actual hire. Um, what's kind of funny, and this is another shout out for Haley, who's on my team and she's my support manager, but it's kind of funny is she started with me as an intern and now she's our support manager and it's been nine years now that she's been with the agency. Oh, wow. That's, that's um, Yeah. So it's awesome to have somebody like that. Um, and she's, you know, so many clients speak highly of her, but you know, her and then Len, you know, are some of the original core team members that I had and they're still with me today too. Um, Somebody said, what's, yeah, your just, secret, what's your secret for keeping employees around for so long? Um, you know, it was, it's really creating an atmosphere that people want to be a part of. And like, like they can see the opportunities that we have and the growth that we've had, even from where we our early beginnings of like working in this tiny little house. So after Chicago, you know, the, that commute was like eating away at my soul. So I live about an hour Southwest of Chicago but the problem is when you would go to work during normal times of like oh. rush hour traffic, I was usually driving about four hours a day oh, gee. and I just couldn't do it anymore. So I was like, you know what? After this first year, you run out of audio books. I'm going to go back. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go back. I started working out of the house for a little bit again too. And then I came across this, um, you know, small office in Oswego. Mm hmm where we were able to set up shop. And that's really where the team started growing too. And we added some staff. Um, so yeah, we worked in this little like 10 by 10 room that was in a converted house and it was just upstairs. So we just each had a desk in the corner of the room and that's where we were. There's like, it was kind of funny. We joke about it, but the bathroom upstairs even had like a bathtub because it was a house. So uh -huh. it's like, yeah, we've got a bathtub just over there in the bathroom. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was cool. And then, you know, we just started growing and growing and we had to move out of that place, went into another office, um, outgrew that office, moved again. So we just kept bouncing around. And as we were growing, we started to kind of shift our, client portfolio too. It's mm -hmm. like we started to do a lot more, um, you know, healthcare, okay. industrial uh, manufacturing and nonprofit. And we kind of drifted away from food and beverage, which is kind of sad because that's, it was like a passion of mine. So 
within this like recent year or so, you know, I wanted to get, go back to that too and like start mm-hmm. to bring that back. And that's where, you know, the podcast came to play too that we just started this year. Um, that's really just focused on beverage brands because mm-hmm. it's, it's something that's, you know, it's fun because, you know, so many companies that are in that space, the amount of energy that they put just into their brand is awesome. Like the creative and everything. And it's just oh, it's fun because it's, yeah, it's a brand that people like that, you know, they live that brand and the community is so awesome too. And like everybody's so helpful. And one of the jokes that I, um, I'm going to, I'm going to murder the quote here, but Paul Mabry, who's uh, who runs a, a wine um, intelligence tech um, company. He, he's very, mm-hmm. he's very um, active on Twitter. And then one of the challenges we face on the wine side and the winery side of the industry is that most winery, winemakers and winery owners, they're pretty resistant to the term marketing. Yet, yeah. as Paul mentioned, he's, I've never seen one industry that's so composed from the ground up other than the juice. It's completely built on marketing, yet be so resistant of marketing. Everything from the label to the bottle design to the packaging, everything's marketing. Yeah, that's the that's the one word they don't want to mention. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I it's that. it's weird too. It's because like the connection to digital, I think, is what triggers that too. Because they do so much for like point of purchase and like what you see in person, and mm-hmm. you know, even the bottling itself, like just being able to hold it, like you can tell that so much thought and energy is going into that. But then when you start to go online and you look at some of these brands, besides like. Instagram, I would say the rest of the, even the social platforms and then some of the other things are just not there because there's so many like creative people that are in the industry too, Mm -hmm. that, you know, people in beverage have some type of artistic background, whether it be music or arts or photography. Mm -hmm. And that's why usually the visuals are really good. Like they've got that nailed down, but a lot of them don't have the data side to it of like going through analytics and understanding that. And, you know, that becomes the challenge is like, and maybe that's why, as you're saying, it's like such a scary word is like, Oh man, this just sounds expensive because I don't know what it's going to be like to do (laughs) all these analytics and the data side and everything else. But it's, it's really not that bad as you start to dig into it. Yeah. And help help it. That's something. Yeah. And I am a, I'm passionate about it too. It's kind of exciting to nerd out on the data. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. So you're back. I mean, so you're, I mean, so as you're helping um, brands and as your company has expanded and grown, you, what I really like Mm -hmm. is how concentrated you are on the web dev side. How does the web development translate to what you're doing on the marketing side? Yeah. So Web design has been our core. So actually, when the f- company first started, the actual name was Idea Web Design and Internet Marketing Inc. It was a r- super long name. <laughs> so I, I even shortened that when we started hiring. Yeah. So now it's just Idea Marketing Group. Um, but that was like the one thing that I saw is when I was at the other agency, we were just cranking out websites, but then there's nothing else really happening afterwards. And you know, SEO had just started rolling out and becoming Mm -hmm. a thing. So when I started the agency, you know, that was something that I wanted to make part of that core service offering is like, we're, we're building websites that can be found Mm -hmm. and scale and grow. And like really websites are the foundation of all marketing. Like absolutely for digital, when you're doing social, you point it back to the website. If you do email, it comes back to the websites, print design still comes back to the website. So like that's just kind of in our core. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I did a lot of it because I was a one man shot too. So it's also my background. That's what I really enjoy about it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and we just kind of stuck with that because it's what we know best. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we do is, you know, for brands today is we come on and we build custom solutions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we we take a deep dive into their brand to really get to know them and understand them, find out what their challenges are, what their goals are, and then create solutions for them. Yeah, too often. Yeah, because there's so many... 
run into agencies that just kind of slap up a website and then, and then they start their social media or they start all the marketing around it. But the website isn't built properly to support any of those initiatives. And what you have is four or five. And we, we, yeah. we ran across that too, where you, you're, we inherit or you get a new client and you've got five or six completely mm-hmm. disconnected um, marketing things. And then there's a website. Well, you, and what I like about what you guys have yeah. done, I've seen from some of your past work, the website, you brought the website back to the central post of the marketing. And that's the command center that, in, that from what I can exactly. see is all the, all the digital initiatives go right back to it. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't use any themes or templates um, just because it really does take the time to build it the way that the business should be. Like you shouldn't be taking your brand and trying to fit it into a template because Mm -hmm. you should be unique. And, you know, we also focus a lot on user experience and the user interface of a website is critical for lead generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, Essentially, everybody owns a website because they want more business. I mean, that's plain and simple. But then when you start to challenge them on, you know, why did you do this? Or, you know, how come you did you just buy a template that was like $80? And that's what your your whole business runs on for your success. And it's just, it's kind of mind boggling to hear that because... Yeah, though custom web design is expensive, it, it really is an investment in the business. And it's something that's going to you know, probably even save you money on doing all of your other marketing down the road, too. 100%. I, we, we've all had clients come in that have, they, they bought this $80 template. And what they don't understand is it probably takes just as much effort to make that $80 template look like their brand than if you just started from scratch. Because the one thing about those templates yeah. is you've got to put something in every single one of those boxes. Otherwise, it doesn't look anything like the template that you purchased. And you may not have services or the ability to fill all those boxes. So I d- definitely think, I mean, starting, especially with today's um, builders, it, it's easy enough to start from the ground up and just build a truly bespoke yeah. site that speaks to the brand. That, that's awesome, you guys. Are yeah, doing. yeah. Because all those templates, I mean, the other thing that, a lot of people that just don't know the technical side or even like privy to this is when you view the source code of a, a templated themed website versus a custom built one, the code is so much cleaner and it actually does matter, especially in the eyes of Google is, Absolutely. you know, load speeds are one of the highest formulas that they use for ranking websites is like how fast does the website load and where's the first point of content on your website? Because a lot of these template sites just throw so much garbage code in there. Yeah, well, they, they, give, maybe, you, they give you a dozen variations. You can have a blue theme, a green theme, a yellow theme. It could go, and then you can have this there. But they've got to create the code to support all those variations. And very few, yeah. if not any, eliminate all the excess code. When they display your site, mm-hmm. they have they have all that. There's just all this cruff that's just sitting there that doesn't need to be there. That that you get. Yeah. So most people, and that's up. what's frustrating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you could look at the source code and you've got to scroll. I've seen some where I had to scroll almost 1,500 lines before I finally got to where the actual content on the website was. <laughs> and those are the key phrases that the search engines are trying to find and rank your website for but they're buried so far down in the sloppy code that, you know, you're just wasting money because yeah, maybe you saved money building a website and getting it live and posted, uh-huh. but it's not being found and it's not working the way that it should be for your business. Oh yeah. So it, going into 2021, we're all, um, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully COVID's we're slowly kind of moving out of it. People are coming back into the world. Restaurants are opening. We're all thinking very positively. What sort of user experiences are you... What are you building into the websites today to help that user experience and maybe aid in that transition of going back into into the world? Yeah, definitely. Um, And I... You know, it's great that things are going to be opening up too, but we've been in shutdown mode for so long that this is now like part of who we are. Like... Mm -hmm. A lot of people have just gotten used to the convenience of doing things from their home. Mm -hmm. So even though, yeah, it's going to be great to go out and visit restaurants or 
you know, sit on a patio with friends and just have large groups again, this isn't really going to go away. Like this is going to be part of it. So focus. I guess I should, I guess I should too. rephrase that over the last year. How has um, mm-hmm. this pandemic reshaped the personal nature of websites? Cause we had to, we all, our agency included had to really step up that sort of engagement because the, it, a physical interaction was no longer possible And that. You're right. That was right. stick. That's going to stick going. Yeah. Forward. And that's here to stay. So like looking at your website of how can you create that same experience, but online, maybe it's a virtual tour of showing the facility or doing an online tasting where you're inviting people. Um, a lot of the online ordering has skyrocketed because that's one of the best ways to do it. Or even just the ability to do online orders, but with, in-store pickup, like maybe or curbside pickup, like mm-hmm. where you're just going sure. there. Um, and, you know, we've been doing that on websites too, is like, what can we do to make the user experience as seamless as possible and as easy as possible? So a lot of times it's just looking at a website and just analyzing it. Um, so we use heat maps, which is a great tool for us to actually see how are these users actually using the website? That's so then great. we can make adjustments and be like, you know what? You've got all this stuff at the top of your page, but nobody is engaging with it. Mm-hmm. Like we need to take this content that they keep scrolling down on the page to click on and bring that higher up on the page mm-hmm. to improve that experience. So it's really like, and then the thing that I've seen a lot over the years is people are finally now realizing that they need this data for their websites. And if like, mm-hmm. All right, let's do these tools. Let's, um, you know, we've got another piece of software that we use that does reverse IP lookup, which has been great for like B2B companies because you can see who's coming to your website even if they don't engage with your contact forms. Oh, wow. So now your sales team also knows these people are visiting, but there's something wrong. Like we're seeing what pages they're going to. We can see how long they're spending on the page, but they're not taking that next step. But now, here's a name to, that you can have to go and reach back out to them and be like, Hey, we saw you were on the site, but you didn't find what you're looking for. Is there something we can do to help you? Is that a, is that a custom software that you use or is it something that like a small person that doesn't have an agency can subscribe to? Yeah. It, so we have an affiliation with lead feeder is the name. Um, so it's a great piece of software. It's, it's not expensive. No, and it's it's really based, the pricing is based on the amount of traffic that you have coming to the website mm. and okay. essentially the leads. So the, they treat the leads as the unique visitors coming to the site. And that's great. And then, I mean, I would imagine through um, dynamic content and user experience, you could even shift some of the messaging that's on the page based on that reverse IP lookup. Exactly. And that's something we even did for our own website to where we were able to make changes. Um, But yeah, it's something that, you know, a lot of brands, especially in the beverage world, are not doing. They just have a very basic website that says, here's what we carry. Here's a rough about page and then see you later. But then you have like the, the big players in the beverage brand that are like a complete night and day difference with mm-hmm. the, the quality of the website. So it's, it's like, how do we get some of the small to mid size beverage brands to really step up that game to deliver that same kind of experience? Because it is possible. Oh, like yeah. there's a lot of tools that are out there that allow you to compete with the big players. Um, and that's the best way to start to gain additional market share. And the playing field has totally been leveled. At least since I've I've been in the developing websites since ninety three ninety four, <laughs> everything's changed. But now it's it's before it would take just mountains of code. Now there's already code available that allows you to create this dynamic dynamic experience that's different mm-hmm. for everyone that comes to your site. And for us, what we deal with a lot of wineries, and even even in different industries, but with wineries. We, the biggest thing to do is we're convincing them that you, you know who this person is when they come to your site because they're club members or they've been on the site or they've purchased on the site before. Show them something that is relevant to them. If they've only bought Chardonnays and they've only bought white wines, 
why are you showing them a Cabernet on your homepage? You can show them the next release of that Chardonnay because you know they're purchasing history. And that creates a more relevant experience. And that I believe that's you're doing some of the same type of stuff. How are you guys using yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we haven't dove into dynamic content quite as much. Um, so we've been doing a lot of just SEO landing pages that are targeted. So that's probably the most effective way that we've seen it is because, you know, we're looking at what the user's searches for right now, uh-huh. and then we're delivering a landing page that's relevant to that search. So that's kind of the, the route that we've been going. And then looking at, you know, what are the click funnels that they're doing? Like that's something, you know, previously years back, you would just have a, a simple contact form and that was it. You submitted it and they were done. Mm-hmm. Is like, you know, when someone fills out that form, the journey does not end there. No. Like that's, there's so many different things you can do. Like you can add things to the thank you page to get them to do something else. Like maybe it's follow you on social. Like, these are people that have already engaged with you. So why not leverage that or, you know, put them into a CRM. Like mm-hmm. that's, there's so many people that just are not using CRMs, which is kind of crazy because even like HubSpot has a free CRM. It doesn't cost you anything mm-hmm. and it allows you to track those interactions with your websites and collect that data, which is, you know, going to be huge because those are, you know, audiences that you can sell to later on. And yeah, through different, through, as you were saying, clip funnels, it's, a, I always re- describe it as a choose your own adventure. So you're just kind of guiding someone through this, mm-hmm. um, through this story and how they get to the end. You can craft, you can kind of make them walk through the story to your own goal and they're, they're yeah. selecting it and they're, they're, yeah. they're in charge of their own journey. You're just guiding them through it. That's a great way. I mean, and when we, when I use, my content usually I, it's what you're describing is a rock solid way of that dynamic user experience which is super powerful and no one's there's mm-hmm. not too few people doing it in the beverage space right now it's it, that's mm-hmm. great to hear that you're you're going that route yeah and the other big thing that brands should start to look at is like use the website as a recruiting tool that's one thing that yeah. is going to be needed as places are opening oh, up and everything Good is point. like, now we're ready to bring on staff again, but how are we going to attract the staff? It's like, use the website to show your culture, like mm-hmm. use it as a recruiting tool. Um, Cause that's one of the areas too, that, you know, people just don't really leverage websites enough that way. Like you don't really come across like a careers page on a beverage brand, unless it's, you know, a pretty big company. It's also a hidden SEO trick in that search engines do, um, they gravitate towards career mm-hmm. pages. And if you put all the different roles that are up there, you're, you're able to embed a lot of um, those keywords into those job descriptions as well. Exactly. Yeah. Even if you don't have an opening, you just, you, just as you're saying, you create the position, which you create a page and now you're have a word of like head brewer or something along those lines or you can just say, you know, there's no positions at this time, but submit your resume. So you have something on file for when you guys are ready to start hiring. Now you don't have to start from square one and try to like post an Indeed link or something and spend all that effort of trying to find somebody. Yeah. So other, other than um, starting with a stock theme, what's one of the biggest pitfalls, you know, someone can make when if they're to try to DIY their own website? Um, so... I think the biggest challenge is really when you have somebody that's almost like more of an owner operator that's running point on the website build is because they're building the website the way that they want to see it. When really a successful website, you have to build it in the shoes of the customer. Mm -hmm. And that's usually the biggest problem that I see because a lot of them are like, Oh, I want my logo to be bigger. And I was like, well, is your logo really the reason that people are coming to the website for? I'm right. like, we, we got to take a step back. I'm like, I understand you're proud of that logo and you spend a lot of time on it, but they're here for the content. Like we need to make sure that we're, you know, addressing the pain points that your audience has, but then providing the solution that they need right away. Yeah. Um, so I would say that's probably the biggest number one challenge is, you know, people are designing it for the, 
the problem that they have, maybe it's a sales guy that says like, well, this is what I want on here because it's going to help me get leads. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, it doesn't really because you're not at that point yet. Like we have to do some more engagement on the website before we can, you know, nurture them to that level that you're ready to have that phone call with. That is an excellent Um, point. Yeah. So I would say that's probably the the biggest challenge that we see in the lack of data. There's so many companies that, you know, maybe they already have a website and it's just like a redesign project, but then you find out they don't even have Google analytics or they don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. Like they don't know what it is, you know, like that's so much data that determines the next step of a redesign of like the website architecture, like, you know, what's the outline that we're going to work off that we've seen your users want. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'd say those are like the biggest pitfalls is like designing it for yourself and then not using data to drive your decisions. And not thinking of thinking, thinking of what you like and not what the customer likes. I love that. That We too, (laughs) too often, especially even as agencies, I always say some of the hardest thing you can do is to, design your own site because your all your personal preferences are suddenly magnified. And you for, even as agency owners, I, I myself forget about um, that sometimes. So e- excellent point. Yeah, yeah exactly. I've got, I need to be reminded to all, all the time. <laughs> so yeah, shifting. So what's keeping me busy these days outside of work? Ah, so the podcast, um, ah, which is, that. which has been awesome. So being somebody that's, you know, behind a computer, for most of my life was a little weird to all of a sudden just switch gears. I mean, obviously we're still behind a computer right now, but it's, it's just a different experience and it's been fun. I've, I've already started meeting people that I would have never met before. Mm -hmm. You know, I can already tell, you know, building connections and friendships that are going to last a long time. Um, So, and just hearing the stories too. I mean, you know, entrepreneurs love to hear, success stories from other entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. because they understand, you know, the challenges that have been faced and what's happening. So just being able to hear all the different stories of the challenges that people have had, how they've overcome them. I mean, it's been inspiring to me too, to, you know, reignite some of that passion because after so long of doing it, like just like anybody, you start to feel kind of burned out. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now I mentioned it's, it's called picture this. Now, where, yeah. where can they find it? So picture this. So you can just do uh, picture this uh, podcast dot com. Oh. It'll just redirect you right to our website. Um, so it does live on our agency website, which is idea mktg dot com. Um, and then we're pretty much on Instagram and Facebook as well, too. So we're, we're posting a lot of recaps there and then as well as uh, LinkedIn as well. Okay, great. And I, and I know you're a big fan of um, beer and spirits in general. What, do you, what are you drinking mm-hmm. these days? Oh, man. Well, right now I'm, I've got a monster because it was an early start today. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> so let's see. I, I'm trying to think of what I recently had. Um, oh, man, I, I can't think of the name of it right now, which is killing me because it was a, a vanilla milkshake IPA that I had. Um, the other day, it was so good, and it's this torture that I can't think of the name of it no, right no now. Shit. I like that. Here in, yeah, but here otherwise, in with, what's here, here I was going to say otherwise was. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's okay. I was just going to say. But th- speaking of vanilla, there's a um, brewery out here um, that does a um, cream cream IPA, a, a vanilla cream IPA, Mother Ooh. Earth Brewery. It's local here in here in Carlsbad Vista area. But imagine oh, it's kind of cool. not, not kind of cream stout. We also have Belching Beaver that does a peanut butter stout that you you might like. Mm. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, peanut butter is right up my alley too. Um, it's probably one of my favorite. <laughs> one of those sweets. It's one of those stouts you don't necessarily think is going to be good until you try it, and then it really it's just got a nice dry, just a slight peanut butter finish. Anyhow. Mm. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. So, um, any other um, things keeping you busy today, or any any other things that we want to kind of leave on? I know 
you talked about a few things in the pre pre show. Um, I know you've got a charity that you're are very, um, very passionate about maybe want to give them a shot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I'm really excited about this. Um, you know, it was something we started looking into charities because for a long time we've done some like volunteer work at various charities and everything, but I'm like, I want something consistent that like is hits home for us and our staff. And there's this one that we came across that's called hope for the day. And just what they're doing for, you know, increasing awareness around mental illness and talking about suicide prevention has just been something that's so cool. And Mm -hmm. I got really excited about it too, is because, you know, we're part of the Illinois Craft Beer Guild and we joined it recently. And just seeing, you know, how friendly people are and helpful with each other is like, you can see an email drop of like, Oh, my label machine just broke. I need some help. Could somebody hop on or could I borrow somebody's? And, Mm -hmm. you know, within like an hour, someone's like, yeah, just swing by our place and grab it, whatever you need. Awesome. And just seeing that community is so cool. But then this email came through and I was reading it and, you know, it was um, Nicole with Malt Europe. um, And she's like, hey, guys, I just wanted to throw this out there to the guild is there's this collaboration that we're doing where we're partnering with hope for the day. And it was so crazy because we had literally just gone through our presentation about becoming partners in prevention with the organization. And then to see that email, like within just a couple of days, and I was like, Holy cow. And they're creating this hazy IPA that's called things we don't say. Oh, And it's just, it's so cool because all of the sales of this beer are going to go straight to the nonprofit. And it's a beer that's really just meant to help increase awareness about mental illness. That's fantastic. and so important. So definitely, definitely everyone check that one out. And yeah, so we're recording um, next Friday. So the episode should be out. um, I would say probably by the end of March. Awesome. Keep up. Keep a lookout up for that. If this episode doesn't, I believe this will may come out right out. But definitely go check out Aaron's pitch of this podcast. It, support hope for the day. What a great great initiative. And if you're looking for website build in the beverage industry, I gotta say without reservation, Idea Marketing. If you're looking for the solid solid foundation for your business, look to them. And Darren, once again, where can they where can they find you? Um, yeah, so our website is IDEA, and then it's the abbreviation of marketing. So it's mktg.com. Awesome. Well, th- well, thank you so much, Darren, for being on the show. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me, Drew. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.